All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science to kids around the world. Of course, there are no classrooms in right now, and we usually broadcast at many live classes across the continent, but we really appreciate all of you tuning in on YouTube today as we continue continue this fantastic series of the Toronto Zoo. So here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we broadcast with scientists, explorers, amazing facilities around the globe, live, free, and no registration required. I also want to note for today's session that in addition to taking questions on YouTube in the chat bar on the right, we are also using the Slido app. So I will put this in the chat bar as well, but if you go to Slido, just type it into Google and use the event code DRAGON. We'll be taking questions there today, upvoting our favorite <laughs> ones, and I'll be sharing those with our speaker. And we'll also be doing a few live interactive polls as well. So without further ado, in our third in our Toronto Zoo series, we are joined in the Australasia Pavilion by Mary Ellen Fraser. So she is an education coordinator there at the Toronto Zoo. And she's gonna walk us through and explore some of the amazing animals in the pavilion and it teaches a little bit about animal movement, how different animals get around, why they're so different from one another. And particularly, we're gonna focus on a tree kangaroo and a Komodo dragon today, among others. So I am very excited. I hope you guys are pumped too. And so without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Mary Ellen, and take it away. Awesome. Hi, everyone. So like Jesse said, my name is Mary Ellen. I am a coordinator here at the Toronto Zoo in our learning and engagement department. I'm so excited to have you guys here with us today. And while the Toronto Zoo is closed currently due to current situations, uh, we are still caring for all the 5,000 animals that call our zoo their home. And I'm really excited to show you a few of them here today. So like last week, we are going to have a riddle of the day. Uh, so I'm going to show you guys the riddle in a second. We'll go over it. And while I'm talking today during my conversation, I will be saying the answer. And I want to stress this right now. The answer is not going to be an animal name. So it's never going to be like a tree kangaroo or anything like that. It's a behavior or an adaptation or a name for something that an animal has, but multiple animals might have it as well. So it's not going to be an animal's name. It's going to be some sort of adaptation that they have to help them survive. Um, so our riddle for today, we'll take a look at it here. We'll get it nice and close. Our riddle is, look at my baby, it is so small. I keep them inside so they don't fall. We each have one in a different place. We like to be careful just in case. So I'll give you guys a second if you wanna screenshot it or look at it or write it down. Um, and today while I'm talking, if you think you found out the answer to our riddle, you can put it in the chat or uh, like Jesse was saying, uh, you can do it in the psycho area and then uh, whoever answers the riddle first in the chat will get a shout out at the end of the video. All right, so let's keep going here. We're gonna move on. So our first exhibit here, unfortunately, our tree kangaroo has actually turned her back on us for a little bit, but this is Puzzle. She is a tree kangaroo that we have here at the Toronto Zoo. Um, to give you guys a bit of a better photo, I'm gonna turn around to the sign really quickly and hopefully uh, Puzzle will start moving around for us. But if you haven't seen one before, this is what a tree kangaroo looks like. And the first thing that people often comment on is it doesn't look like a kangaroo they've ever seen before. Often when you think of a kangaroo, you think of the ones, the big guys who stand on their two hind legs, you know, kangaroo jack, those kind of famous kangaroos, they hop around like this. Um, tree kangaroos move in a very different way. So you might've noticed if we pan back really quickly to her exhibit here, Puzzle likes to live up in the trees. Um, and if you think about how typical kangaroos move, it's a hopping motion. That's how they get across the ground. They use their really strong legs and their big strong tail. It's kind of like a third leg or a kickstand for them to help them move across the ground. Now think about it. If you were climbing a tree and you could only hop, do you think you'd make it very far or would you fall out of the tree? I know for myself uh, speaking, I would definitely fall out of the tree. I'm not very good at climbing them. And Puzzle here would probably also have the same issue as I would. So something that makes them unique or that adaptation that they have is they don't have these hips. So they can actually walk just like humans can. They can move one leg and then the other. And so by doing this, they can hop, but they can also walk through the trees. A couple of really cool things you might've noticed on this photo. And you might be able to see if Puzzle moves around for us. You might be able to catch a glimpse of her long, beautiful tail. So she has a really big tail, similar to a normal kangaroo that you might think about. But her tail doesn't act as a third leg for her. It's to act like balancing. So if we pretend right now that I'm trying to walk a straight line along the ground, if I try and walk, I might get unbalanced as I try and do it. But if I stick my arms out on both sides, that I'm able to counterbalance myself as I walk. Puzzle does the same thing with 
her tail. She uses it to help offset and um, move her balance around. Another really cool thing is an animal who lives in the trees, how do they protect their baby? So for a normal kangaroo, they have a pouch that runs horizontally across their belly. And their babies are born quite tiny and their baby crawls up their stomach and sits inside their pouch. Now think about it, if you're an animal who's climbing up trees and then down trees, if your pouch is running horizontally, your baby is going to fall out of your pouch, unfortunately. So tree kangaroos, they have a special adaptation with their pouch. It runs up and down like a zipper on your pocket. So if you turn back to the sign here for a second, we can see at the bottom, you can see the little baby poking their head out of the pouch. Their pocket runs vertically up and down so that when they're climbing in the tree, their baby doesn't fall out of the pocket. So animals who have pockets like kangaroos, so our normal ones and our tree kangaroos, they're actually called marsupials. And we're gonna learn about a couple more of them as we continue on our journey. So unfortunately, Puzzle doesn't look like she wants to join us. We'll give her one more quick second before we move on. Um, but then we're gonna go have to check out some of the other really cool animals we have here in the Australasia Pavilion. She's just being a little shy this morning. All right, we're gonna keep going through the pavilion. Jesse, we're gonna turn it back to you for a couple seconds while we walk through and try, try and see if we can see some of our amazing birds in here. Fantastic. Well, I'll pin the video on you guys so that we can make sure we see those birds. But while we're walking, I just want to note for anyone tuning in on YouTube, and we've got 300 people tuning in right now, so welcome in. Do check out our past sessions with the Toronto Zoo with giraffes and digestion and with the amazing animals in their Tundra Trek exhibit, which is one of the best sessions we've probably ever done with live animals ever. Uh, so I really encourage you to check it out on our YouTube page. All right, let's check out some birds. So what kind of bird is that, guys? So this one is actually a kookaburra. Uh, they're actually kind of a famous animal in, um, like when you see movies and things like that, often actually when you see um, a uh, movie and they're panning through a jungle, you'll often hear the kookaburra's bird call, even though they're not actually found um, in a lot of the jungle scenes that you see in movies. Uh, but they have to do that. It's called, you know, the magic of movies and things like that. They use the sounds that are the coolest. Um, another really one that works well for that, if you've ever seen a bald eagle in a movie, they usually sound really heroic and amazing. It's not actually what they sound like in real life, it's kind of more of a squawk, uh, but they have to be painted as this beautiful, amazing creature. So uh, there's some movie magic that happens sometimes. Oh, here we go. We got one of my favorite birds right here coming to check us out. This is a Victoria crowned pigeon. They are the largest species of pigeon in the world. Uh, they're actually my favorite bird that we have here at the Toronto Zoo, mostly because of their mohawks that they have. I think it's quite fun to watch them walk around. And we're going to try and zoom in on their feet a little bit so you guys can see them. So our topic today is animal movement on the ground specifically. And that can kind of confuse people that we're talking about birds because they're not usually who we maybe think of when we think of a ground animal. But birds who you see who are able to walk on the ground often have a harder time landing on branches around them. And that's because their feet are a little bit flatter and made for more of that walking ability. Well, large birds, so birds of prey, so like eagles, hawks, things like that, they have some very impressive talons. So this is our little bio fact here. So you can see all the birds of prey and their talons. So you can see that they're nice and hooked and curved. So if you think about it, if your toenail to your fingernails get really overgrown, it would be very difficult for you to put your hand down flat on a table. Same thing if you have a dog or a cat at home, if the nails start overgrowing too much, you may not be able to have them walk normally. It might get uncomfortable for them. Think about it, if you are a large bird and you have this talon curling over your hand, uh, your feet, you're probably not able to walk flat on the ground and you'd have to be perching up on a branch where you can wrap your foot around something. And that's kind of how you can differ if animals are more ground-based or if they're more in the air-based as well. Same thing by looking at their feet, you can see if they live on land or in the water. So if they have a webbed foot, and that's typically when you see an animal when their foot itself has a webbing between it here. I'll have a bio fact to show you guys. This is a mallard, so a duck uh, imprint of a foot. You can see that it's webbing between the toes. That allows them to push and move through the water easier. This is also a very flat foot. So they're able to walk on the ground with it as well, but they wouldn't do so well perching up in trees. All right, let's keep going through here. There's some great birds in here. I like to tell people, if you ever come through here, we have two of these type of birds. They are called the scarlet-chested parrots. 
We're gonna take a second. I saw one earlier. Oh, and I hear one. He's just up there. They are an absolutely gorgeous bird. Hopefully we can see it on camera. Uh, they are rainbow colored with that bright orangey red chest, blue wings, and a yellow body. Um, if you ever come here to the zoo, try and find them. They're quite tiny um, and they fly really quickly. So sometimes they're harder to find. They're very beautiful and pretty vocal. This is an example of one of those birds you would only really ever see up in a tree. You don't really see those guys on the ground as much. All right, we're gonna keep coming through here. We'll see if we can find another couple birds. I see a couple more of our Victoria crown pigeons in the back. Like I said, they are my favorite bird. One of them is named Ditto. Um, and unfortunately I can't tell you which one that is. So I call them all Ditto. All right, coming through here, we're gonna do a little bit of a transition between our aviary and our other animals that we have in here. So come on with us. Now, our next animal is known to be one of the most fierce animals out there. He's definitely not somebody I would wanna come up against. Let's see if we can find him in this exhibit here. Oh, he's just at the back over there. So some of you might recognize him. He's a pretty famous animal. Um, this is the Kilat, our Komodo dragon. So Komodo dragons are one of those creatures who, uh, they don't move very much. So a lot of people can underestimate their skills and abilities. Um, while he does look like he's short to the ground, kind of stocky little legs, you would not want to be in a race against Kilat. He would definitely beat you. Um, <laughs> although he can run uh, about the same as like a really fast human, uh, he would definitely outrun me and catch me and I wouldn't want that. Um, so basically what he does is he hunkers down and he can sit for long periods of time and he waits for his prey to go by him. And then he lunges out with that quick burst of energy to grab hold of them um, and give them a deadly bite. So we have here as well, we have one of his cl uh, claw of a Komodo dragon to see. So these can help him again. He's got that nice big claw and that can help him move through the ground, kind of like a cleat. Uh, if you've ever played soccer or football before, and it also helps him to grab hold of his prey when he's trying to eat them as well. All righty. Give him a little break here. We're going to continue on and see some of our uh, cuter, more fluffy and friendly uh, creatures here at the zoo as well. See if we can find one. So we're looking right now for our wombats. We have two here at the zoo. Their names are Arthur and Matilda, and it looks like they are inside eating some snacks right now. So we'll stay here for a couple seconds to see if we can uh, get one of them to come out and get a bit of a better view of them here as well. Um, if you want, we can just take a look at their photo really quickly here to make sure that you guys can see what they look like. So they're kind of a short and stocky creature. Um, they're meant for digging. So these really short but powerful legs are meant for digging through the dirt and making a tunnel system. So if we pan up to their exhibit on this side, you can see all of those holes that they actually like to dig. Um, and it's part of their enrichment here is they get to dig them and every once in a while we will collapse them in and they get to redig them all over. These guys dig their tunnels to be about the perfect size for them. Uh, so really only their little sausage body can fit through it. And that's an adaptation for them to help them survive. If they're running away from a predator, by being the only thing that can fit through their tunnel. Nothing else can come in after them and maybe harm their babies or anything like that as well. They also have some pretty intense claws, just like our Komodo dragon, that are built for moving that dirt away around them. Um, now, these guys are another example. They actually have something in common with Puzzle, our uh, tree kangaroo that we saw a few minutes ago. And they also have a pouch. So they are a marsupial animal as well. But we talked about the differences in the pouches. So regular kangaroos have a pouch that go horizontal. Tree kangaroos have a pouch that go vertical. But when you think about it, I mentioned these guys are really good at digging. And that's what they do. They dig through the ground. And if you're an animal and your pouch is at the front of or top of your uh, torso area and you're digging in the dirt, well, you're going to fill your pouch with dirt. And that would suffocate your baby. So their pouch is actually kind of more at the bottom of their torso, it's horizontal as well. And so this way it opens backwards. So the first thing their baby actually sees is their butt, 
but it keeps them safe and sound and away from all the dirt that they're digging through as they walk. Now I mentioned before, I think we can get a better, slightly better view of one of them here. Um, <laughs> these guys, again, are a very quick animal. Uh, they can run about 40 kilometers an hour, which is definitely faster than a human. Not that they're really gonna come after you maybe to attack you like Keyleth the Komodo dragon would, uh, but if you were in a race with them, I would be betting on them for sure. Uh, they are very quick on the ground with those little stocky legs. All right, guys, so we talked a lot about animals who have moved throughout the ground. Um, we are gonna actually try and find us another really cool animal to focus in on right before we just head to our questions. So let's come through here. We have a couple of really cool reptiles that we keep in this pavilion as well. Um, some of them you might recognize more than others. Uh, some of you might actually have these guys as a pet at home. These are a bearded dragon. So Jesse, I think we'll bring it back to you here. Um, and then we will take some questions and we'll just keep panning over some really cool reptiles we have here. Fantastic. Well, what a great exhibit to do that in. Um, and so thank you so, so much for an awesome presentation, Mary Ellen. For everyone who's tuning in, over 400 people. We've got six states across Ontario and more. We really appreciate you being here. Type in questions in the chat bar. Do try and keep the YouTube chat bar to just questions or type them in on Slido and I'll, I'll take as many as I can from there. I also want to thank you, Mary Ellen, for introducing the term sausage body into my scientific lexicon uh, with regards to wombats. That was awesome. Uh, but let's begin going to slide out. Uh, so Ethan in Boston wants to know, how many Komodo dragons do you have there at the zoo? Um, so currently right now, we only have the one. We have our male Komodo dragon, Keelat. Uh, but maybe sometime in the future, he might be uh, getting a little girlfriend for himself. So hopefully we'll have more soon. Fantastic. Out of curiosity, quick follow-up. How do you get another Komodo dragon to the zoo if you were to do that? That's a good question. Um, so we have to be very safe with our Komodo dragons. Um, they are a uh, danger animal. So they have a lot of uh, venomous, or they have venom and they also have a lot of dangerous bacteria in their saliva that can be deadly uh, to not just uh, humans, but pretty much any other creature uh, living even to themselves. Um, so we have to be very careful with them. If we were to move another Komodo dragon here, it would have to be part of an SSP. So basically what that is, is a species uh, protection plan that we have with other accredited institutions around the globe. And we look at the genetics of animals. Uh, I like to refer it to more as a dating app for animals here at the zoo. So if you think about it, Tinder for animals, that kind of thing. Maybe Bumble now, that's probably the more popular one. Um, but we match them genetically speaking so that they are able to be uh, healthy for the next generation. So if we found another female who would match Keelat, we would go through the process of contacting uh, the place that they, that Komodo dragon was held at. Um, and they'd have to go through, through some training to make sure the journey wouldn't be stressful for them. Um, and then we would very carefully uh, try and transport that animal here, maybe on a plane, a boat, truck, any sort of way like that. Very cool. Thank you so much, Mary Ellen. All right. Uh, Maggie and Max have researched Komodos a little bit. They know that they're a huge animal. What is the biggest challenge in taking care of them at the zoo? Biggest challenge? Hmm. Um, I have to believe that one of the biggest challenges is because they can be such a dangerous animal, uh, you have to be so careful with them. So actually, before we went live here on YouTube with you guys at home, uh, when we were walking the pavilion this morning, just to make sure everything was ready for us, there was actually a keeper in the exhibit this morning. Um, and so when we are taking care of the exhibit for the Komodo dragon, they have to make sure that the Komodo is away and inside. They have a secondary holding area for it. Uh, and they have to make sure that they are safely away before a keeper can enter the exhibit, just to make sure that nobody is hurt or stressed out during the process of taking care of them. Yep, fantastic. Um, all right, Sebastian wants to know how high tree kangaroos can climb. We saw them in the tree. Can they go up really high in the canopy or do they? Um, so for a lot of animals who can climb, it's pretty much until they're, the tree they're on can't support them anymore. Uh, so if you think about it at home, uh, kind of a closer to home, at least in North America here, if you see a raccoon, they can pretty much go almost to the top of trees, but they can't go out on the branches of the trees. And that's because the branches, as they start to go further out, they can't support the weight of the animal anymore. So they can go as high as they feel comfortable or as much as the tree can support them. All right, fantastic. Um, so a bunch of questions, uh, we're getting this question a lot from YouTube and from Slido. And so what do the dragons eat? What are you feeding them there? Lots of things. So um, we actually have an enrichment program with our Komodo dragon. So if you ever come to the Toronto Zoo Zoo Camp, 
or to a program called Operation Conservation. Um, you actually might get the chance to design an enrichment for our Komodo dragons, and we put food in their enrichment bags for them. Uh, so the key lad here, I've seen him get fish before, he's gotten mice before, he also gets horsetail. Uh, that's kind of a treat for him as well. He'll get lots of uh, yummy snacks like that. I will say though, I have seen and heard him before. Uh, you guys can't see right now, but there is a little pool in the front of his exhibit. We'll try and pan down to it there uh, so you can get a look at it. So in the pool, sometimes his food, because we have to toss it over a glass barrier when we're feeding him for keeper talks and enrichments, occasionally it will land in the water um, and he's not very, um, interested in going after it once it gets wet he prefers it to be just on land so sometimes it can be a little tricky um, if, if we miss toss it and it gets in the water by accident don't want an angry komodo dragon in your hands upset at you from across the enclosure gate um all right <laughs> laura in toronto wants to know what's the advantage of a pouch so you you talked about pouches a lot different orientations of pouches why have a pouch at all yeah, for sure. So um, for animals who are marsupials, their babies are often born being really tiny. So we say as a size comparison, they're about the size of your fingernail or about the size of a jelly bean. So they're born and they are really, really tiny, which means they need a lot of support and help from their moms and need to be protected. So having them in a pouch is an easy way where they can be safe with their mom. They're nice and warm. And there's also a place for them to nurse inside the pouch. So after they're born, they don't need to leave the pouch for at least a couple months um, where they can grow and develop. And when you start seeing them poke their head out, that's when you know they're starting to get a little bit too big for the pouch and they need to start coming out and exploring, need to stretch their legs a little bit more. Fantastic. Uh, Macy asked a question that we get a lot on, on YouTube in these sessions, and that is of the animals you showed us today, which one is the most endangered? What should we be worried about in the wild? Ooh, okay, give me a second. I gotta think about that one here for a second. So Komodo dragons are definitely endangered. Uh, these guys live on islands, and so any species that is endemic, which means it's only found in one location in the wild, uh, we have to be really careful with them because uh, once their habitat there is ruined, they can't exist anywhere else in the wild. For Komodo dragons, the biggest threat to them right now is other Komodo dragons, so large males will fight and attack each other, but also humans. People are quite terrified of Komodo dragons in the wild. And I definitely understand that uh, from a standpoint of I do know how dangerous they are, uh, but we do need to leave them alone in their habitat. So people hunting them and taking over their land is one of their biggest threats. The uh, large bird we saw earlier, the Victoria Crown Pigeon, they are also listed as vulnerable right now on the uh, red list. So they are starting to decrease in numbers, which is quite a shame. And as well as the tree kangaroo as well. So Puzzle we saw who at the beginning, she's also facing uh, quite a few threats in her habitat. We saw that she likes to live in big treed areas. Um, and unfortunately there's a lot of logging um, and natural disasters that are kind of taking over their habitat. Yeah, uh, well, I'm, you know, it's, it's a dark story, but I'm, I'm glad that we got that question. So thank you to Macy. Um, all right, Amelia and Gabriella want to know, how do you become a zookeeper on Slido? <laughs> <laughs> How do you become a zookeeper? Um, so there's a couple different ways I guess you could go at it. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, there's not necessarily um, that many zookeeper jobs, but I want people to understand that when you're at a zoo, uh, it's not just zookeepers here. So there's people like myself, Shannon, our camera woman, uh, Sean, our behind the scenes man here. We all work in the learning and engagement department. Um, and so I actually started here at the zoo as a camp counselor. And honestly, that's one of the best ways if you're looking to start out in a zoo and you wanna gain experience there, um, is you want to just kind of get into working at the zoo at any job you can, and you can start to work your way through. In terms of schooling, a lot of our keepers who worked here have a background in biology. Maybe they have a background in veterinary care or zoology, uh, any animal caretaking. Um, if they have any background with farming or anything like that, or large animals, uh, maybe as a hobby or anything like that, that's a kind of a good way to get in uh, at a location or a place like this, for sure. Fantastic. Quick follow-up question on that. So Claire, Jake, and Kate in Alabama, who have been joining us for a huge amount of our sessions the last few weeks, they want to know what your favorite animal is at the zoo. Mary Ellen. <laughs> oh, I love that question. That is one of my favorite questions that I get. So I can say without question, my favorite animal is the giraffe who we covered in our first live session. 
We looked at uh, herbivore and ruminant digestion. I'm especially excited in case you guys missed that video. Our giraffes are actually pregnant right now, our female. Um, and we are expecting a baby like within the next couple months. So probably two, three months at most. Um, and I'm so, so excited to my core. Um, the, everyone has their favorite though. I know Shannon, our camera woman here, she absolutely loves our um, uh, tree kangaroos here. So puzzle at the beginning, that's one of her favorite animals for sure. Awesome. All right. We're going to come back to Komodo dragons. You guys made the mistake of focusing on it. So that's all the questions we're getting. <laughs> uh, Julia wants to know why they're called Komodo dragons. Like how did they get that name to begin with? Yeah. So if we actually want to pan around here um, and look over this way, we kind of have on our map here, you can see where they're found in the world. So they're actually found on the island of Komodo. So they have something really cool with them. Animals who are found on islands, they can sometimes have this kind of weird uh, thing that happens to them where when you think about lizards, typically they're quite small, but animals who are isolated to a part of the world, uh, smaller animals can sometimes become very large and large animals can sometimes become very small. And that's what happened to our Komodo dragons. If you think in comparison, most people, when they think of a, dra or a, a lizard or anything like that, they think of a, a bearded dragon instead. Uh, and these guys are significantly larger than our bearded dragons that we have. Yeah. I want to highlight for people, too, at home, if you look up an extinct animal called Megalania, it used to live on that Flores Island to the right. It's like a turbo Komodo dragon. And I mean, these guys are big enough, but that's an even larger sort of dinosaurian lizard that used to live in the last few thousand years. So very cool. All right, Athena and Zoe in Waterdown want to know, how often do you have to feed the Komodo dragons? <laughs> That's a good question. It does change every once in a while. Um, last year, he got fed probably a little bit more, um, and that might have led to him gaining a couple extra pounds than needed. Um, large lizards and large carnivores like this, they actually don't eat as often as humans do. So it's not usually an everyday for them, um, especially for an animal who is ectothermic, so cold blooded. So he's going to eat or what we call gorge himself. So he'll eat close to half his body weight in one sitting. Um, and then he won't eat it again for a couple of days or even up to um, more than a week. So he'll eat a really big meal um, and then he'll go fasting for several days. He might get a bone here and there in between, uh, but he probably gets fed at least, I'd say about once a week or maybe once a week, a big meal and a couple small meals here and there. Awesome. All right. Now you didn't cover this animal in our, in our actual talk. We highlighted tree kangaroos, but when we're thinking animal movement, we're having a lot of questions about actual kangaroos and how far they can jump. So if you had a big, tall kangaroo, how far can it leap? Um, so going forward, I'd probably say at least a couple feet. It depends on the size of it. Um, oh, our wombats look to be out as well. I'd say at least a couple feet forward. Um, so they are very powerful, um, but it's not something they would probably do on a regular basis with them. Uh, but they can't leap up very high. Uh, so like when you think vertical jump, it's more of like a forward jump for them. Awesome, and there's our wombat. Beautiful, so what's our wombat's name again? Well, she's so we have two wombats, we have Arthur and Matilda. So we have one male and one female. Unfortunately, I cannot tell them apart. So it's anybody's guess at home if that's our male or female waddling his butt towards us. Right. That's funny. Um, so for the big Komodos, how much do they weigh? We're getting a question uh, again from Julia on, on Slido. So Keelat himself, I believe he weighs around two to 300 pounds. I'm going to say like 280 or so, um, but they can differ on their age and also uh, male to females. So we uh, used to have a female Komodo dragon here and she was quite a bit smaller than Keelat was. And that's actually the best way for us to tell them apart when they're in the exhibit. Because they are solitary, only one Komodo comes out at a time. Uh, so the best thing to do is look at kind of how big they are and be able to tell which one was which. Fantastic. All right. Um, so we're getting near the end of our session, Mary Ellen. So I'd love for people at home, and again, over 400 people tuning in on YouTube, we love that, guys. Thanks so much for joining us today. Where can people go to find out more about what you guys are doing at the zoo education-wise and find out more about these amazing creatures? Absolutely. So there's so many great resources that you guys can tune into. If you head to the Toronto Zoo uh, website, we actually have a parent resource tab now, and you can go and find all of our free 
previous videos and links to uh, different resources that you guys can do at home to continue your learning. Uh, there's also some general resources there. You should also check out the Toronto Zoo. We have our own YouTube page, Facebook, Instagram, and our own TikTok account as well. So be sure to go check us out on all of our social medias. Um, there's lots of cool behind the scenes that you get to see for our animals and lots of really cool uh, different videos. Every day as well at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time here in Toronto, we are doing a live keeper talk at different animals around the zoo. So you should check out on our Facebook page. You can get the link for that live video as well. Fantastic. So I've put those both in the comment bar and the chat bar, uh, both the zoo resources and us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, all we're doing in the coming weeks to bring some more great digital programs over 40 uh, to 50 in the next two weeks alone, including again, those at the zoo every Tuesday and Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Mary Ellen, this was fantastic. Thanks so much for taking us on a tour of the Australasia exhibit today to learn about animal movement. Thank you for having me. I just have one question before we go though, Jesse. Did anyone yeah, of get course. the answer to so we had hundreds of answers to the riddle. Like you, you said it and we had kangaroos. We had all sorts of things. It was mass chaos. Uh, Eric in Sudbury was the first person to get it. And he said marsupial, which is our answer for the day. And yes, very good. Awesome. I just wanted to double check if you got it. Yes, marsupial is the answer to our riddle today. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jesse, for having us out. Uh, we look forward next uh, Thursday, so this Thursday coming up, we're going to be in our Africa's Pavilion as well, looking at how animals sleep, why they sleep, and some of their adaptations. So be sure to check us out there as well. Can't wait, and we'll see you all soon. For now, have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone, and thanks for tuning in.